Keone, I've got you on the Mogul Live chat. How are you? Good. There you are. Good. Nice to talk to you. I was going to say, I, uh, I thought we may have some technical issues, but <laughs> you've been there all along. Great to see you. Yeah, you too. Thanks a lot for having me on. Yeah, it's our pleasure. Thank you very much for, for being here. Where have, we, uh, where have we got you from at the moment? I'm in California. I'm in Santa Monica. And uh, what are you currently working on uh, this, this particular month? Well, right now I'm juggling three projects at three different stages. Um, I have uh, one that we're sort of prepping up now called Terminal Station that we can talk about. I've got another one that I finished uh, right, I mean, like literally two days before the shutdown, we finished shooting in New Orleans and actually we were in Romania at the time. And so that's in the festivals now. And then I've got one I'm prepping now that I was just shooting during the pandemic in Hong Kong. So oh, I'm kind fantastic. of at three different stages, yeah. That's fantastic. For anyone that's uh, just joined us, Keone Waxman, a uh, very, very experienced uh, director, writer, producer. I, uh, I had actually prepared a couple of assets um, for anyone that's going to jump in the chat and uh, perhaps is just jumping in and, and wants to get a quick update. I mean, your films uh, speak for themselves, you know, Cartels, Shooting Gallery, um, In Solution, uh, True Justice. Like there's a list of just I mean, I've, I've watched them all. That's the thing. I think they're all amazing. That's great, man. I mean, hopefully there's a lot of people out there who watch them all. <laughs> yes. So if anyone's got any questions as we're talking to, uh, to Keone uh, about these films, um, any questions, a good question, guys. So ask it through in the chat at any point. Um, so, I mean, kind of with that, I, I wanted to sort of circle back to your career a little bit and just find out uh, how did you get into the industry? What was your very first job? Well, um, I started, I started a long time ago, but I started when I was in film school in Colorado. I uh, was actually up in Boulder, Colorado. It wasn't much of a film school, but there was a lot of TV going on in Denver. So during, you know, at night or on the weekends, I was a camera assistant for whatever movie was rolling through town. And then during the week, I kind of ran the film with a couple other guys. I kind of ran the film uh, equipment desk at the university. So I sort of was making my films and renting equipment so I could make my films. And I was working as a camera assistant. That's this fantastic. Was a, yeah, it was well. <laughs> Did you make your first film in... Colorado or did you make it in Los Angeles? No, I made it in Colorado. I actually, um, ironically enough, I was there and we started, you know, I started, I moved up to being an op camera operator for all these shows, but at the same time I was doing short films and so forth. And one of the companies I was working with asked me to write them a film because I started, some of the short films were winning awards. Uh, long story short, I dropped out of school and moved to Denver and made my first film there. So I never finished Boulder, but um, I went to film school there. Could, could we kind of talk about that just quickly, that, that yeah. first film that you made? Yeah. Um, you know, what kind of part did you put, in, put yourself in there, like write a director? And what sort of um, budget did you have to work with? Because I find that fascinating with successful film directors, their first well, film. Well, you know, it, you know, I always say the, hard, the hardest thing to, you know, the, hard, the only thing harder than making your first film is making your second film, right? So the first film was really hard. Um, and it was, again, I was in film school and the people who I, were, I was working for, you know, different production companies there wanted to produce this film and wrote a script. It was, it was, it was actually kind of cool because it was set in, it was, it was essentially a riff on Chet Baker's life story, but he, you know, tenor sax player, this or that, um, in Colorado at the time in Denver, you didn't have, he had just rail yards and, you know, and big dog food companies and all kinds of like very industrial. Nobody was there, you know, it was before the Rocky stadium was there before everything. But what they had was a really cool uh, uh, jazz call, club called El Chapultepec. Painted on the side, it was, you know, uh, hot jazz and, you know, or cool jazz, hot food. And they would have all sorts of, like, hardcore, like, heavy hitters from all over the world come and play at this place. So we would hang out there, and I wrote the script about a jazz musician. And we were trying to set it up, trying to set it up. And, again, I had just dropped out, you know, of, uh, of school. Um, and somehow we got it to Michael Madsen who had just done a film that nobody it hadn't come out yet. He was all excited about, but everyone in town was excited about called Reservoir Dogs. And, you know, he showed up as a like, you know, this, this is a great movie. I, I cut off a guy's ear. It's fucking great. I can swear. <laughs> um, and, you know, and I was like, this is great. I love this guy, but can you not do that? Can you just play like a jazz musician? He's like, yeah, totally. And he like, he taught himself to play the sax. We wrote all the music. It was pretty cool. So we shot that in Denver. Um, I don't know. I want to say like 91, something like that. And then I moved to LA after, right after that. So. And just to kind of circle back, uh, great to see in the chat, Thomas, Isabel, Joanne, uh, I'm, if I get this wrong, uh, Anger, amazing stuff. Thanks for the feedback, guys. Any questions, Keone, as we're going? Any questions, good question. Um, Keone, so I want to ask you, so with that film, is that still the hardest film you've made? Uh, no, actually, like I said, the harder thing is the second one, because after that, you, you know, you feel like, wow, I kind of did it. 
right? And, and people want to see it, but everybody sort of has an idea of what they want you to make and how you want to do it. And I just moved to LA, which is a lot harder than living in Colorado, I'll tell you that, um, at least back then, for sure. Um, it, but, you know, you keep writing, you keep making movies and so forth. So, you know, every film's a struggle. Every film's its own, you know, it's its, its own baby. Um, you know, so I wouldn't say that that was the hardest one, but that was definitely the one that I think, um, you know, you woke, you, you woke up and you thought about the movie. You went to bed and you thought about the movie. You, you know, you lived and breathed it. And so as you, as you go on and on, you start to sort of get into a rhythm. Like, this is how you make movies. This is what you do. But that was definitely the one that I think felt like it was coursing through my veins more than anything else. You know? Sure, sure. Well, like, uh, and uh, again, there's more and more people coming in the chat. It's a, it's a great group already. We had Thomas Churchill yesterday, and oh, he great. mentioned a film. Uh, he's actually in the chat listening and watching at the moment. Hey, Tom, uh, we have, we're supposed to have lunch. We haven't done it yet. <laughs> feel free to respond, Thomas. Uh, <laughs> and again, anyone, uh, any question? He's uh, Churchill Productions has also just joined. Um, so circling into then, I, I'd love to get your sort of take on Mogul and how you mm -hmm. kind of first heard about Mogul and then what we're going to be working on. Sure. You know, I mean, for me, it was interesting because when I, I first heard about it, like I said, I was, uh, Thomas just said, awesome, looking forward to it. Um, I was, uh, I was in Hong Kong at the time and it was weird because um, it was, you know, right in the heart of the, of the pandemic. And it, I felt like I was, I honestly felt like I was in Westworld. You know, you felt like this isn't real. Um, I, I left my family back in LA and I'm making a movie there and, you know, um, uh, I was going to come back and make this, the terminal station. And um, I heard, hey, you know what, you know, from my producing partners and, and everyone involved, they're like, we, we you know, we want to do this with Mogul, we want to do, and they told me all about it. And it was a very sort of, um, I want to say a strange, you know, strange sort of thing, because I'm so far away. And as I'm hearing something that to me sounds like what I wish when I was making Almost Blue, I existed at the time. Um, and I'm like, that sounds great. And so came back, finishing the film, and now we're kind of rolling into Terminal Station. So. And we can't give away too much, but Terminal Station, uh, is there any kind of um, sizzle that we could sort of sell on it? I mean, uh, look out for the, the, the action scenes. Oh, I'm, yeah. trying to, I'm trying to walk on the tightrope here as well. No, I feel, I feel, you know, I mean, the idea of Terminal Station is that we're trying to do, look, you know, I, I can get into we talk about the other films, but I've all, I always approach my action films like they're westerns because I think that that's where you have an iconic character. The iconic character of a Western is the same as a samurai film, this or that, where, you know, it's really the, your main guy. He's an anti-hero. He, you know, he needs to, something has to happen to him to do good, to do bad, um, but something has to change. That's an action movie. That's a Western. So Terminal Station is really a Western, but it's an action film. So we're su shooting in Eastern Europe. You know, I would say if you want to, if you want to put into a log line, it's, you know, it's John Wick action and it's sort of Reservoir Dogs to go back to Madsen. Uh, structure. So I'm trying to make uh, like a, the indie Western action film in Eastern Europe. That sounds awesome. Yeah. <laughs> right, I was going to say, um, Taylor uh, Kalish, uh, favorite story with Buzz? <laughs> yeah, she's, ta she's talking about, she's talking about my, my assistant director, Brian O'Sullivan. So she's throwing a shout out to him. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, and again, that was a great question, uh, Taylor. Any others, keep them coming. Uh, so with Terminal Station, obviously part of the, the Mogul Showcase, um, what sort of role are you playing in that production? I uh, wrote it and directed it. You know, we're, um, you know, we're, uh, again, you know, I'm going back to my action roots. Last two films that I did, you know, the Hong Kong film was, believe it or not, sort of a R-rated romantic comedy, which should be interesting. Um, it's Wolf of Wall Street meets Crazy Rich Asians, if you can think, you know, imagine that. Um, and what's, what's the title of this one? It's well, it's changing. It was our working title was Hong Kong Love Story because we had to have a title there and we had to have, you know, we wanted to sell the idea that it was a romantic comedy. But um, as we're cutting it and we're kind of finding the film, we're realizing that it's a little edgier than that. So we don't want to be too misleading with the title. So right now it's it's uh, Hong Kong Love Story, but it's going to change. Um, I know the one before that it. that I did in New Orleans called The Ravine, which is based on a novel, um, a real story. It's a thriller. Um, great cast, great, you know, sort of great environment, all of that. So to go back to Terminal Station, I'm, I'm kind of coming back to my action route. So I'm kind of happy about that, you know. So um, we're going to, you know, it's going to be kick ass. It's gonna, we're going we're gonna to kill a lot of people. I was telling someone the other day that Hong Kong Love Story was the first film I made in 25 years where I didn't kill somebody on screen. So now I have to make up for it in Terminal Station. We're going to kill a lot of people. So, so we're going <laughs> to, yeah, we're going to see you in full swing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's fantastic. I mean, anyone wants to talk about Tacchioni's favorite films as well, or, or any particular uh, scenes in any of them as well, feel free to, to jump in. Um, I, I want to talk about Shooting Gallery, 
Uh, mm -hmm. That's a great film. Um, you know, what was your motivation to, to kind of get that done? Okay, so going back to your, your previous question, that was probably the hardest film to make. Um, I wrote that film years ago when I first actually when I first moved to, to Hollywood. And it was really about pool hustlers and street hustlers and all my friends in Hollywood. And it was before the big earthquake. It was, um, it saw, you know, everybody in town picked it up and wanted to make it for whatever reason, four or five, five, I think it took like seven years to get it made. But for like five years, everyone wanted to make it and nobody did. And ironically enough, two people kept coming back to it. Ving Rhames and Freddie Prince Jr. And then, uh, no joke, one day I got a call and it was Freddie saying, hey, I think I'm ready to make the movie. I called Ving and, you know, Ving was in and out of that movie like three times, but that's Ving. Um, and then um, found out that we were going to shoot it in New Orleans. And I, so I, I, was, I went to New Orleans and I lived there for a long time, not a long time, but for a few months and rewrote it for New Orleans. And that was 15 years ago. And, you know, it became um, more of my understanding of New Orleans and less of my sort of trying to put my friends and my, my life here on screen. Um, and then, I, you know, again, uh, The Ravine, 15 years later, I go back in and make that movie. And I think I'm still trying to figure out exactly how New Orleans is because it's such a great city, such a great place, you know. So it really became one of those things where, um, you know, it was originally called Pool Hall Profits. Um, and we changed the title. But um, it became a, move, a passion, you know, um, and it really became a passion. And also, so for me, at least a way to discover New Orleans, which I didn't know, know anything about at the time. Curious to ask you about Freddie Prince Jr. obviously being cast as that. Did you always kind of single him out as the guy you wanted to play? Or was it more he was the one that wanted to do it the most? A little bit of both. You know, we, we cast a lot of different people as we, like I said, it was like five years of trying to get it made. And, this, and bear in mind, this was back when, you know, Freddie was, this was when he was, um, I think he was in the, like, the, I know you did last summer time right um so he was he was pretty he was a pretty hot uh, actor in town at the time um and so it was one of those things where he really played pool he was really good at it um he really wanted to do it and you know but then his career kind of blew up and went to a different direction so you know we cast other people um skeet Ulrich at one point i mean a whole bunch of different people at times but at the end uh he's the one who called me and said hey i think i'm ready to make it now and you know and so we did yeah and uh, and ving well, Ving, I've done a few movies, a couple movies with Ving. We've tried to do a few movies, but we've only managed to put two together. But, you know, Ving loved playing his character of the, of the sort of the, you know, it's a Fagin, you know, uh, story. And he's, um, he's great as sort of the, you know, the state course, uh, you know, uh, Fagin character who, you know, has a, a stable of uh, pool players and hustlers. Um, Cue Ball Carl, you know, he, uh, he loved that role. Um, and he brought so much to it. I mean, he was, he was fantastic. And to be in New Orleans with Ving was, was great. You know, but I don't know if you, you know, people seen the movie, but uh, Cue Ball Carl does this whole thing with the chicken foot and he dips it in whiskey and he sucks on this chicken foot the entire time. And that was Ving. He was like, you know, he's like, this is what I do or this is what my guy would do. I'm like, all right, keep doing it. So, you know, he was he was great to work with, you know, and then we went on later and made an action movie with him, too. For, for any of the actors that are either going to watch this later on or, or listening right now, I always find it really interesting when a director works with an actor multiple times. Um, what is it about him that makes him a great actor or you enjoy on set with him? Ving, you know, he's, he's one of those guys that just his presence is as strong as his acting ability is as strong as his voice. You know, he shows up and um, he, you know, he, uh, he knows what he wants to do. Um, he's great to, you know, kind of be on set with, you know, when you're blocking and you're trying to figure stuff out, he's got a lot of great ideas. And he also has just an incredible amount of, of, um, I want to say presence that he doesn't have to do much. You know, when I did uh, force of execution with him and, uh, and Steve and Seagal and Brent Foster and uh, Danny Trejo, but um, Steven and, and Ving had a really great sort of, you know, clash of, of, uh, of not personality, but of charisma which I think you always want to, you know, you always want to find that on screen, you know, I mean, you know, drama is conflict, right? That's so. a great mix. Yeah. A lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of strength in both those guys. Um, I've got just so Andrew and Nightly Crypto have put up a couple of questions. Good to see you in the, the chat, Andrew, Nightly Crypto. Uh, here's a quick question that's coming as an actor following uh, the fact that you won the showcase event. Um, what's your view about Mogul and the vision of this project in relation to filmmaking. So I, th I think just dissecting that, I think, you know, what's, what's your reaction to the vision of Mogul uh, making movies? Well, you know, um, again, like I said, I wish, I wish Mogul was around when I made my first film. And I do have to see Heisa, 
Haisa, who is this, my, my female lead in uh, Hong Kong Love Story, just said hi, Keone. So I have to say hi, Haisa. Um, she's Thanks in Brazil right now. Yeah, she's in Brazil. Um, she's amazing in Hong Kong Love Story. She's, she's incredible. She's, uh, you guys wait, you guys, she's going to blow up. You, you heard it here first, Haisa. Anyway, I hope I'm saying the name right. right. Anyway, um, Camilla is her character's name. Going back to your, going back to your question, though, um, you know, look, I, I, the, anything you can do to make, to demystify, first off, financing films, because it's such a crazy thing. Um, you can finance a film any 100 ways, but at the end of the day, nobody really understands how it all, you know, how it all comes together. I think what Mogul's doing is allowing people to say, look, you know, you want to make this movie, you want to be involved in this film, I want to see this movie as, a, as an audience. These are all the elements that, again, you know, <laughs> when I did uh, Almost Blue, I didn't have. You know, when I made uh, Shot Man in Vegas and Almost Blue, it was really more about the idea of, you know, this is some cool shit that I want to tell a story about. And these are like really cool people I want, I want to be in the movie. You know, I'm going to borrow my friend's car. I'm going to do this. Well, that element brought into today's, you know, filmmaking when there's so many movies out. It's so hard to break through. There's so many, I mean, you know, a $300 million movie is nothing. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, I make action movies and the action movies I make are not $300 million. Um, and so how do you compete with, you know, a guy in a suit, you, you know, the CGI suit, you don't, unless of course the audience wants to see something that you're putting in the film. Right. So for me, a lot of it is just like what I think mogul is doing is allowing people to actually, um, participate like this, which is incredible. <laughs> Thanks. This you too. Um, uh, which is incredible. And at the same time, you know, it allows people to go. So how does this, you know, we're talking about how do you make a movie? You're talking, you know, I mean, obviously you go to actor showcases, you go to film festivals, you go to all these places, but generally it's people talking about the film they just saw. They're not talking about how do you get a movie made? How do you get a movie made that I want to see? People wanted to see Terminal Station. Guess what? We're going to make it. It's going to kick ass. So it's like, it's like, I, I, I just think that the interface, the concept of being able to, you know, like, I'm sorry, the term is definance, I think. You know, but to be able to actually put together the approach to make a film and finance a film are all things that people are starting to realize they don't have to be secrets anymore. You can actually figure out how to do exactly. it. Exactly. And I think you I think you touched on something as well, which there is a bit of a gap. And I spoke about it, uh, not the last guest, Thomas, but uh, uh, Elizabeth uh, recently, which was if you're an indie filmmaker and you're kind of at that level where you're just struggling to get like an Ari or a decent camera, and then the other end, like you said, there's like three hundred million dollar film, which is probably <laughs> going to have another, you know, couple of hundred million in P and A. It's really light and day between how you can get your project out there compared to something else. And I think mm -hmm. that opportunity with Mogul about connecting people and and giving everyone an opportunity to get forward rather than just the person with the most money is it's an yeah. interesting concept. Well, and, and I think that that's that's what makes making movies art instead of content. And there's nothing wrong with the crossover. There's nothing wrong with content. But at the end of the day, you don't go, I'm going to go see content. You're going to go, you say, I'm going to go see a movie. <laughs> There's a reason right, for right. that. I'm going to read a book. I'm not going to read content. Do the same thing in today's world. But the, the edge is when the audience wants to see it and the filmmaker, the writer, the actor, the painter, the whoever wants to make something that, you know, that means something to them. Like I said, I always try to, um, Adrian, hi. Um, I'm just responding to all the people popping up. Yeah, no, please uh, do that, Tony. I, I, I'm reading them as we go as well. So if anyone's Adrian was in a movie Keone. I made a long time ago, not that long ago, in uh, in Canada. Um, I've worked with him quite a bit, and he was in there. He was in True Justice. What am I saying? He was our. He was the sheriff in True Justice. Um, anyway, um, what was I saying? I, I was just saying I think you know the ability for people to to want to choose to make something that means something to them is I think the difference, and I think that Mogul is allowing people to get there. Yeah, no, I think that's that's exactly what a lot of people have got the same reaction. Um, I, I, great to see as as well everyone interacting in the in the chat forum as well. Um, this is a good one too, Adrian. What's up, bro? Big fan. Uh, <laughs> Nightly crypto. Uh, love to talk a little bit about Steven Seagal and mm. that relationship because that's. I mean, you guys have done just a slew of great films together. Yeah, but a also, few. Like, <laughs> we made yeah. a few movies together. <laughs> how many? How many are you up to where you've directed something he's he's done? Um, that's a, it, it's a, I measured in time more. <laughs> okay. Um, it's been about over 10 years, I think. I think we've made, you know, uh, we've made close to, uh, I'll put it this way. We did, term, term, uh, uh, we did True Justice, which was 23 episodes of television, 26, excuse me, episodes of television, uh, with Adrian. Um, and we did, I think I've done maybe, I'm going to say close to 20 films, 15 films with him. You know, as a writer, director, uh, you know, Most producer, 20 films. Else. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Um, what was the first reaction? How did you guys basically connect to begin with? 
Well, <laughs> that's a long story, but um, and it's a, it's a good one. But um, I'll give you the condensed version. Is that um, uh, my producing? You know, my producer on that show, my producing partner on Terminal Station, uh, Ben Dang. He's he's uh, been an inter integral part of, of Stephen's career before I even met him. Um, but um, he. I think he reached out to me first. We were going to do a different movie. He reached out to me years ago, the first film. And he said, hey, Stephen wants to meet you. And I said, okay, great. And he goes, but he's in New Orleans. And this is the first, actually, was it the first time? No, I'd already been there. So I, this, is, this is after, uh, uh, after shooting gallery. And he said, can you come down and, and check it out? And I said, oh, okay, great. What's he doing? And he goes, well, he's gonna, he's, his band is putting on a show. And um, he just wants to meet you. And so I went down there. And um, there's a lot of funny anecdotal stories I could tell you another time about my time down there um, and meeting Vince for the first a time. Good story here. Oh yeah, no, it's a good, there, there's good stories. But the, the, again, the condensed version is, turns out that Steven's band is playing at the foundation room at the House of Blues. And so in between, you know, uh, sound checks and this and that, I'm talking to Steven. And, um, you know, eventually, you know, uh, I was told, you know, look, just talk to him, see what's up. Just, you know, don't talk about yourself. Don't tell him where you're from. Don't tell him this, just talk to him. And the first question Stephen says to me is, where are you from? So I said, well, I'm from Hawaii. He goes, where? And I said, well, I'm from Oahu. And he goes, where? And I said, well, I'm from Honolulu. And he goes, where? And so I give him my home address. <laughs> and he goes, I know your people. We should make this movie. So I was like, wow, that was super cool. So then I hung out to watch the show. And I'm, as I'm watching the show, and he's up there playing, and I'm in, you know, we're in, uh, in New Orleans, and, and we're in the House of Blues. And I'm thinking, well, I don't know. I mean, like, Stephen does action movies. I never watched his movies. You know, and I had done a lot of action movies, but I'd moved on to other stuff. And no joke, while I'm watching him, I think I, I want to say it was, um, I forget which Neville, but one of the Neville brothers came up on stage and goes, my good friend Steven Seagal here is playing and, I, and played a song with him. And I just remember looking up going, if, if, if one of the Neville's in the House of Blues in New Orleans is going to rock out with Steven, then I can make a movie with him. And then we made a lot. So <laughs> that's how I met him. And that's how I started working with him. That's a great, that's a great story. And then, uh, so True Justice, obviously, I've, I've singled out just one or two, but there's so many different uh, Steven Seagal films. Um, I mean, True Justice. And stories. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, what, what was the process there? Because you directed, um, produced, like, why did he obviously want to go in that side of making episodics over, over film? Well, you know, um, that again was, that was, the machine that was with him, the producers and his, and his whole team that was with him prior to me starting, you know, I had done a few stories. Kelly Robson, what's up? He's Kelby, excuse me. He's in uh, the ravine. He just said hi. Um, Good to but, see you, Kelby. Uh, <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, we, we did, I think, I want to say maybe three films with Steven, and they were always talking about doing a series with him. And, uh, you know, he, like I said, he had a team with him that did a lot of the writing, a lot of the producing, you know, so forth and so on. And um, when it came down to actually putting together the series that he wanted to do, they had a first season, 13 episodes up. And they sort of, you know, said, we want to shoot this. We decided we we're going to shoot it in Canada and Vancouver. Um, I had shot in Vancouver a lot. We had just shot two, I, I want to say, two films, Stephen films in Vancouver. So um, it was a pretty good fit to go there. Um, I came in to sort of, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, do the pilot and, you know, kind of run the look of the show and be the, you know, be the, not the showrunner at the time, but to be sort of the, the head of, you know, the look and everything and work with Steven, you know, he still was writing with his team and he was doing this, he was doing that. Um, he had a lot of say in it. And here's the thing about the show is that he was originally conceived as a cop show. Okay. So, you know, that's great. We built this great set. You know, Andy Deskin, my, my uh, production designer at the time, built, built an incredible set, uh, uh, you know, a little trivia. We actually took over the old Watchmen back lot. They had just finished shooting um, Watchmen like a year later. And so we took over that back lot and turned it into essentially our, our, our back lot. Um, and so it was great. We had, you know, we cast the whole show. We found some great actors to work with. Um, but as we started getting into the show, we realized, you know, what Steven, in the movies I'd done with Steven up at that point, what Steven does is not a, you know, he's, his, what he does on screen is vengeance. You know, you piss him off. He's going to kick you in the nuts, break your arm and throw you through a window. Well, guess what? That's one thing cops can't do. So as we started getting into the show, we started realizing, you know, we're kind of stretching the stories because people want to see Stephen, you know, get you in an arm break and toss you through a window. Right. Um, and so when the second season came in and, I, and we had a shift of the writers left, I took over the writers room um, <clears throat> to work with Stephen on it. What we did is we said, why don't we sort of, well, we killed off most of the people. And we said, let's put, put them undercover. 
And now Steven's character and, you know, um, and the show can go from being a cop show to be something more like extended movies. And so really what the whole thing was is that we started doing every two episodes. If you watch the show, it, it all clicks. Uh, every two episodes can be one movie because that's what I do. So we started, so we did the second season as essentially six and a half films. And with these films, um, we told a different story, more like his movies. We had a third season lined up, but he, you know, Steven was done with, with, uh, with, you know, shooting TV. Um, he wanted to go back to Arizona. And so we uh, didn't do the third season, which is unfortunate because yeah. we had a really great storyline for that. Yeah. And I mean, if you if anyone that's, uh, that's seen True Justice, I mean, it's got a very distinct look about it as well. Um, yeah. You know, the way you guys shot it. I thought you did really well, especially could condense that much of a storyline into each episode. Uh, it's, it's hard to do because there's a lot to kind of cover. Um, mm. With, with uh, again, anyone that's joined us, uh, feel free to ask any questions you like. We're kind of like working our way through uh, a bit of Kelly's career, but also Mogul, the new film Terminal Station, and, uh, and some of the films he's done as well. I, I asked this yesterday to uh, Thomas Churchill. Questions just popped up before I continue. Uh, what's your biggest challenge during the shootings of Terminal Station? Well, we haven't shot it just yet, but what are the mm -hmm. challenges so far? Well, you know, I'll tell you, the, the, the biggest challenge with a movie like that is we do a lot of these action movies for a reason in Europe. And as you set them up and as you move forward, what happens, and especially in Eastern Europe, is it starts to get really, really cold. And so, and the nights get long and the days get short. And this may sound more like a technical answer to maybe not a technical question, but the issue is, is you start balancing your story with, okay, how much are you outside? How much are you inside? Do you want to use the, the location? You want to use the idea, like I said, that, you know, you want it to be very John Wick. Well, guess what? You know, uh, it looks great, you know, in, in Europe. Um, it, that's the look. However, how much of it are you outside? How much are you inside? And therefore, it all sort of tumbles into that. So that's where we are right now. So again, a technical answer to the question, but that's kind of where we are in the, in the development prep process. Great. Yeah, and good, good answer. Uh, sorry, good question as well, uh, Edgar, as well. Because again, this is, uh, this is all the prep work that gets done, which is probably the less glamorous side as well. It's the fun uh, part, though. This is the part yeah. of life. <laughs> I, I said yesterday, and Thomas Churchill, we were talking about how some people think of Hollywood as like red carpets, and um, it's all just like fun. Um, mm -hmm. But there's actually the business side that goes uh, into it as well. Is there any advice you could give for filmmakers how to be successful with their film? Well, I'll tell you, you know, I always say, you know, if you have a story, write it. If you have a movie you want to make, shoot it. If you're an actor, get in front of the camera as much as you can. Um, if you're trying to, you know, if you want to write a play, write a play, put it on. And the reason why is because you have to, like you said about, it's just like we were talking about content. It has to rise above, right? You have, people have to see it and they're going to go see it if they know your, if they know you, if they know you're doing it. So that's the first answer to that, right? And then the second answer is like in terms of trying to finance films and this or that, again, and this goes back to Mogul, the idea is that, you know, this is why I say the hardest, the hardest film to make is your second film, not your first film is because the, the metric they, they put on you, you know, how did the film sell? How did the film sell? More so an actor than a filmmaker. Um, not that actors aren't filmmakers, but actors' names and their visage is what they, you know, cha-ching, that's what they look at on screen. So there's a lot of have undue respect for actors because, it, you know, I, 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 get, I get addressed like this. They have to look great. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's so, so, a great you know, point there. Right? So they, you know, so they carry the burden. So a lot of the idea of financing film, it, the burden is put, especially these days, on actors and what they did before. So um, I, I think I sort of circled out of your question a little bit. But I think, you know, at the end of the day, I think you can't take it too seriously first off. You know, if you love making movies, if you love acting, if you love writing, if you love directing, do that. Um, you know, uh, don't take it so seriously. You know, go to the beach. Uh, um, you know, don't go to the red carpet unless, of course, it's something that you really want to, you know, that you really want to do. Um, and you have to separate that aspect of it. And then you have to really do a good job. You have to make something that people go, oh, I know that guy. I know that gal. I know that person. I want to see it. And then the people hopefully who have money go, oh, well, they made money for them. Let me see that what they did. Can you do what do you have next? You know, and I've always I've always sort of fallen into the whole thing where, where if you're if you're working hard and, and if each one is going to be your your best one. Um, then, you know, and obviously that always changes because the next one is going to be your best one. But if each one is going to, you're going to put your heart and soul into it, somebody's going to notice it. And hopefully somebody who says, I want you to make a movie. Yeah. Yeah. That's great advice. I think uh, as we're slowly winding the clock down, uh, obviously Keone's got other things to do today and, and everyone else, we're going to have a limited number of questions, but uh, I want to put it to everyone who's listening in the chat right now. Um, what's your favorite uh, Keone film and 
if they want to ask him about a certain scene or, or how he made the film. Any questions, a good question, but uh, perhaps on your favorite film that he's done. Interesting to see what, uh, what pops up. And also right. anyone that's been in these films, you can, you can ask about that. I know some of you are there. I see your names. So um, I really want you guys to see, you know, obviously Terminal Station but, and the last two films that we did. The Ravine is a really good film in terms of um, something different, right? And, and the actors in it are fantastic. Um, and then Hong Kong Love Story, I'm really excited about because I just think it's something different, you know? So, um, and then I get, of course, then we get into Terminal Station. So if you guys like Terminal Station, I don't know which, which film you'd like Terminal Station, which film of mine you'd like it to be like, you know, I've done a bunch of different types of action movies, but, um, you know, I'm thinking of really turning this one up. Is there any advice you give for the actors out there? I said, I, Thomas had a great answer yesterday and I always like to put this to directors. Um, what is... What do you like seeing in a casting when an actor comes in? A choice, always. That's the main thing. You just want someone to come in with a choice. You don't want to have to give them direction. You don't want to have to explain the character. You don't want, I mean, they always ask questions and everybody asks questions, that's great. But I just want to see a good choice. If somebody comes in and has a choice, even if it's the wrong choice, I know that they thought about it. I know on set that they can do what they're supposed to do. And all I have to do is maybe talk to them about it and ask them a few questions myself. But when somebody shows up and, um, you know, you can be, you can be uh, unprepared, you can be this, you can be that, you can be dressed, this, that, but if you come in and you have a choice, that's usually the person I call back. Got it. Got it. Great advice there. And, and for anyone on set doing stunts, wanting to get into stunt words, your films have a lot of great action scenes in them. Um, is there any advice you'd give for the actor who's going down the stunt direction? Um, well, uh, if you're an actor going down the, the stunt road, uh, make sure you have a good stunt double because <laughs> nobody wants to see you get hurt. Um, if you want to get into stunts, if you want to get into directing, a directing action movies, um, you know, uh, make sure that you have a good stunt coordinator that you trust because like I, I'll write it. I'll write the gag. I'll write the character to be in the gag. I'll, you know, describe how the bullet hits them and they fall into the fire and then they roll into the street and they get hit by the car and then they pop up and then, you know, um, but I'm not the guy who says that they're going to be safe. Your stunt coordinator is the guy, if I have to turn to you and say, is, is this good? I got to trust that it's good. You know, I've seen many, and I've had many um, accidents, not because the stunt coordinators in my show happen because um, you're trying to do a dynamic shot. You're trying to hurry before the sun goes down. You try to do this or that. Those things are going to happen in action movies. But if you want to make action movies, a dynamic shot. If you want to make a, you know, um, a great, stunt sequence these days you know you stitch together with the effects you do all kinds of things but at the end of the day it's somebody there who is you know taking the hit taking the punch set on fire getting ratchet pulled out of the you know doing a high fall driving the car and the stunt coordinator has to be the guy who says we can do this otherwise don't do it and and just kind of going off that as well with terminal station um can we i mean obviously there'll be a lot of stunts and action in, in that particular uh script side but can we talk about any of the cast uh, that are going to be in there, stunt coordinators that will be uh, doing some of the work? Um, right now we're, we're going through, you know, I work with a, I work with a team um, on a lot of these films and that, that I put together with the, you know, with the Seagal films um, behind the camera, right? And so right now, uh, especially the, it's going to be, what I'm getting at is that it's determined on where I am. If I'm in Vancouver, there's a specific team that, that's in, you know, um, if I'm in Romania, there's a specific team. When I was in Prague, there was a different team. Um, so right now it depends on where we're gonna shoot the film. Um, but we're gonna, you'll see a lot of the same sort of um, faces, a lot of the same names. It's just, again, it depends on which ones um, in in, behind the camera. In terms of, you know, actors, you talk about, um, you talk about working with the same actors quite a bit. You know, um, right now we're locking in who we really want to play a couple of the roles. But one of the roles that we're gonna, we're gonna, um, who you know who uh, is going to be in the film is a guy Byron Mann who uh, was a lead in the Hong Kong film I just did and I've done a few films with him and he does a lot of action um and he does you know he does uh, Asian style action he does you know he was in alt uh, you know, Altered Carbon he was in Wu Assassins um he does a lot of different types of action so he's going to have to do something a little different in this but in terms of the rest of the cast I, I can't I can't say yet because it's a bit of a surprise we're trying to put together um, but, uh, you know, rest assured, it's going to be the same action team. So fantastic. We are really looking forward to uh, updates with terminal station. Um, guys, 
this will be my last question <laughs> to, uh, to Keone, unless anyone else wants to jump in. It's been such a pleasure having you. Um, love to just get your, your final advice uh, for anyone who wants to make it in the industry who's just starting out. Uh, obviously changes with COVID, changes with, you know, the way things have sort of happened. If you could go back in time, is there anything you would have done differently? Um, and I'll, I'll kind of put it to the filmmaker rather than the actor this time. Well, you know, I'll tell you on the filmmaking side, you know, the main thing is you, if you have a script that you, if you have a story you want to tell, write the script, get it, get it to people. You know, if they don't read it, don't worry about it. You know, um, it's not because it's bad. It's not because they don't like it. It's because they're busy. You know, um, and, and in this day and age, sometimes it's just hard to get to a script. But when they find the right script and the right person, then you're going to find that you're going to be, you know, you have to, you have to not give up is what I'm saying. Um, but the biggest thing I think that I learned over the years is whether you're an actor, a director, or a writer, a producer, or anything, you have to own your no. This town is really hard to say no because you're always afraid you're never going to work again. You're always afraid that somebody's not going to like what you did. You're always afraid if you turn it down, somebody, you know, um, and that's intrinsic to making movies is because you, it's a, it's, it's like a parade. I would call it like rock soup. You know, it's like I have a pot. Everybody starts pouring stuff into it. Suddenly we have a great meal. Um, and if you don't have a pot, nobody pours any stuff into it. You don't eat. So you really need to own your no, because sometimes you can just say not for me and it's okay. And I think that's the biggest thing because you're not, you know, I, I I don't, I'm not one to have regrets about things that I've made, but I do think that people sometimes go, oh, I would have been this. Oh, I thought it was going to be that. Well, then say no. They're going to come back and offer you something else if you just keep coming. But that's the biggest thing is own your no. That's outstanding. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've had great sound bites. We're, uh, for anyone that is just jumping in the chat, we're going to be wrapping things up. This is uh, halfway through a week where we had Thomas Churchill uh, yesterday. We had uh, Keone Waxman today. And tomorrow we've got Ben uh, Den coming in as well. So it's nice halfway through with the, the bungalow team um but these sound bites are great absolutely great and we'll put this up obviously on the, the mogul platform for anyone to, to watch the interview again um but keone it's been such a pleasure to uh, to have you can't wait to see terminal station it's in great hands with yourself um and yeah just everyone here thanks very much for for chatting we'd love to get you back uh anything else you want to say just before we uh we depart no, I just really appreciate the opportunity. I mean, I think what Mogul's doing is great. And, you know, James, you're, you're a great host on this. And it's just great to sit down and be able to talk to people about it, especially the film. So uh, it's good to start, you know, start, start the rock soup now. Yeah, <laughs> we really appreciate that. And, uh, yeah, it's been a real pleasure to have us here. I'm not sure if uh, the signal's cut out for everybody. We got basically the very yeah, end of that. Oh, here there we go. go. We got you back. There you go. Um, you looked like yeah, it was going. Yeah, I just want to say, look, it's been a real pleasure to have you. We're right behind you with your films. Uh, thank you very much for everyone as well that, that came in and, uh, and was here in the chat. And, uh, I mean, Angus has said, great to see you here. It's a great show. Thanks very much Thanks, for that. Um, and, yeah, look forward to, uh, to talking again. Have a great afternoon. You too. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, guys. Right. See you tomorrow with uh, Ben Dang.